pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, I thought, you know, a fun way to get this kicked off would be, I made a little compilation of some of my Rocket League highlights from today. And I wondered if you wanted to watch it and see if you could guess my rank. So okay. kick off that way. I sent you the video. So let's, uh, let's see what you got. Yeah, this is right up my alley. This is going to be fun. Let's do this. Let's, right, let's, let's guess it. your rank. Okay. I, I like want to make guesses already. I haven't even played it. Okay. Playing this. Let's see. Okay. Let's look at the design choices here. Actually, very clean car design. Yeah. Is that the bronze Simple. rewards? I think, yeah, that's, yeah, it's for Bonds Rewards, you're right. Okay, you're right, okay. You're right. Pretty basic shot there, but, you know, okay. you, you put it home. Very accurate. That's good. Okay. See this? Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> that was a very interesting aerial technique there. Hmm. Right now, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I have a pretty strong idea, just, just based on this alone and absolutely nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Teammate completely missed the kickoff. Yeah. <laughs> See if he can uh, finish it out here. Okay. Yeah. Wait, no, that's going to, that's going to miss, isn't it? Surely he makes that. Okay. So we have a good baseline of skills here. I'd say this is, uh, this is better than average okay. so far. Okay. Better than the average player. Okay. Nice. Okay. That's all we get. Okay. That was an interesting little highlight package. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For my guess. What yeah. What do you think? Uh, so I said above average. I think the average rocket player is plat. So I'm going to say you're above plat. Okay. And I don't think you're quite champ. So I'm going to say you're diamond. It's for me, it's between D diamond two and, or yeah, diamond two or three. I'm going to say, I'm just going to go right in the middle. I'm going to say you're a diamond two. Very, very close. It's a diamond one. Oh, Does diamond that... one. Okay. So, Not bad. okay. So here's, here's the stats. 768 hours. 9,600 matches and playing with this. Oh, this is all okay. the entire time. So what wow, do you think based on, based on the hours, the games played and I'm on switch. Is that not, a, am I blown you away by being a diamond, but is that like relatively good space to be in at this point? I feel like that's really impressive. Uh, I have okay. tried to play on the switch like once in my life and I could not do it. I don't know my hands. I, I just, yeah, so I have tons of admiration for you now. I've just you just gone way yeah. up. Just the fact that I, you're a diamond switch player, I, and also would, 700 yeah. hours in diamond—that's crazy. That's really fast. I thought when I was starting to look up hours of what people play to get to rank, and I realized I was only seven. I feel like I obsessed with this game for years, for like two or three years, and I was like, I played way too much. I realized it's actually not that much compared to some players. Um, oh yeah. But on the switch, I was listening to a podcast you were on. And just everyone was laughing when someone said, oh, I could beat, there's no one that, that started on Switch that can beat me. But why is the Switch so controversial? Like, why is it so like uh, demeaned in the community? I don't think it's so much controversial as just the serious players can't take it seriously, which is, you know, it's just part of the, it's part of the whole gamer culture of like, mm -hmm. uh, people these days obsess over games on a, at a level that they, I don't think used to. Like, I think, Everyone thinks they have to play. If I'm going to play this game and really enjoy it and win and crush my opponents, then I have to play the optimum setup. I have to play the, the, the correct settings. I have to play the correct meta. I have to do everything what, you know, the, the, I have to look up the most optimum mm. way to play this game because it's not about me enjoying it. It's about that I'm playing it at the optimum level. And right. the switch isn't the optimum level. So yeah. there, there's there's where it comes from. It's like, yeah, fair, it's fair. really just like, I think it's actually a physical thing. I think the, the buttons are just like too small. Right. <laughs> I <don't remember> <laughs> that. And I know that I'm, my buddy plays on, that I play with online, um, he plays on like the PS5, I believe it is, or the four. And I remember trying it. I was like, whoa, it looks way better. <laughs> like it even, yeah, like, there's you can some tell that it's things. less, even like the graphic like output is less. Um, yeah, there's like a frame rate yeah. thing. So it's, your frame rates are limited on switch but for the average yeah. for, for most rocket league players it's it's great it's fine okay. yeah, so yeah, yeah. No, you know, the hate is really just from the it's from the elitist people in the awesome. community. <laughs> um on like the the basic level right so like i'm obsessed with this game and i've become obsessed i love this game i, I watch content creators like you i play this game all the time when you try to tell someone about the game right it's kind of often like it's this car soccer and you hit this big ball and you can fly it sometimes feels like a tough sell and people don't get it, but it's obviously such an amazing game. Like what, what is it about Rocket League? Do you think that makes it so special? I think 
Rocket League is just the perfect combination of things I look for in a game, in a video game, and that I, I've always looked for as a kid, but maybe I didn't know it until I saw it. And I think that's part of the reason why it's a tough sell, because just describing it alone doesn't really sound that spectacular, like you said. Actually, it sounds ridiculous. So for me, the game feels like the perfect game. So it's not until you're really in it that you're like, oh, this is great. I think it's because it rides that line perfectly where it gives players control, but not so much that things are impossible. And I think that line is really difficult to hit in all of gaming and Rocket League kind of whether it just got lucky or it was the right talented group of people that designed it. But yeah, giving control to the player where it's like you are controlling the car. It's not a simulation. It's a it's physics based. But I played other physics based games that just feel impossible. Like you, you get in and you're like, this would take me hundreds of hours to do literally anything. Mm. Where Rocket League, it's like uh, the way you progress in the game is pretty natural. Like it, it, it's fun to, to be not good. You know, it's like, you don't have to be really good to have fun in Rocket League. So you can enjoy it right away. But then for players that want to keep going, it's, it's like the skill ceiling is endless. So I think right. it just rides that. That's what makes it special is it just has that perfect combination where there's more for players that want more. And it can be as basic as you want for players that just want a casual experience. Totally. Yeah. And I find like once people play it, they'll fall in love with it. It's one of those games you just kind of yeah. have to try it. But I'm curious yep. too, like your your origin story, like what are your memories of like when you first heard, this, heard about this game and then those first time you ever tried, like what do you remember about that? Oh, uh, I think so fondly on it because we were with a group of our closest friends. Uh, it was me and my wife and we were with, um, yeah, our good friends of ours. And in this one evening, uh, this was in 2015. So in this one evening, he, uh, one of my, the, this friend um, had a VR headset. So I tried VR for the first time. And that same evening, he showed me Rocket League and I tried Rocket League for the first time. So it was like two really great gaming experiences. And so it was, it was, it was a two v two. It was like two couples. So it was me and my wife versus uh, the two of them, and we were just like messing around in it. And I didn't actually really think that much about it. I was like, oh, this is cool. I've heard of this game, but I never got it because it sounds dumb. Um, so it wasn't until I tried it, like it, it was an experience where I was trying it, kind of like couch co op style, and then I went home and got it, and then I, you know, I was hooked from there. But that's my like first experience and. My wife jokes because she was like, this was supposed to be our casual game. Like they showed it to us like, this is a couple's game. And then I never played it with my wife. Like I just <laughs> went off and just, you know, got good at it. And she That's was just amazing. like, what happened? Yeah. I have a question. Linnell, right? Your wife's yeah, Linnell. Yeah, Linnell's I got a question Linnell. about her later because I know she plays a big part in the Sunless Con story so i want to i want to get back to her um but that's okay. that's amazing too. i remember too like the first time i played it like with the different ball cam angles and stuff i was like disoriented and i felt like i was like having fun but i was like this is what the hell is going on so i remember being like totally disoriented and then just one day it just sort of clicks and then you just go for it um yeah. to date do you know like off topic like how many hours have you played in the game to date yeah i mean i can see in steam i think i have let's see I have well over 5,000 hours. Okay. Which is okay. crazy because yeah. I think my next closest game for reference of how much I game is like 500 hours. Right. <laughs> and that's what it was before. Right? Like that's just a game that I played for a while. So that's, you know, that just goes to show you how much I play Rocket League versus other games. <laughs> like it's, that's I'm a casual question. gamer until Rocket League. Now, like I'm a Rocket League player and then a casual gamer outside of that. <laughs> What's the what's the record currently? Is it can you see it in Rocket League? Like there are people what like twenty thousand hours? Like isn't there crazy numbers? There's yeah. crazy numbers, right? Yes, the way Steam tracks it on PC is uh, it's just hours open, so it's a little like there's not really a record to go for because someone could just have their PC on. I think someone does have it unofficially, um, Interesting. but yeah, it's just a. <laughs> Probably 20,000. Yeah, probably something like that. I think the real like actual in-game time is some pros are, I remember a lot of them were north of 10,000 hours, but that was like two years ago. So wow. who knows what it is now? Wow. Wow. It's it's interesting, right? Because Rocket League is, it's a huge game, right? Like millions of people play it. I talk to casual gamers. I'm in, I'm in London, England right now. I was just in Canada. Like people know about this game all over the world, obviously. But I was, again, this, I heard you in this conversation once and I kind of got this sentiment from the way that 
that Rocket League influence talk about it, that it's still sort of like an underdog and that it's not really given the same respect as the other sort of kings of the gaming space. Is that accurate or did I kind of misread like a sentiment? No, Rocket League, I definitely see Rocket League as an underdog kind of story in gaming. Um, I feel like... Well, part of the reason is it just sounds dumb. I think the main, like the real mainstream appeal in gaming is still the traditional like first person shooter and some of the top down like uh, real time strategy games. Those are still the king. And we're talking about like millions and millions of, of international fans as well. Um, but Rocket League is an interesting, is in an interesting place because it does have that popular, like you said, like almost everyone's heard of it. Any, any casual gamer pretty much has heard of it, but um yeah because it doesn't have it hasn't reached that like upper echelon of of mm. you know comparing to the giants in gaming uh it feels like kind of an underdog yeah um but i really like it almost for that reason like right. it's almost like the hipster thing where it's like it's not mainstream you know we're right <laughs> which is funny because yeah. it is enjoyed by millions like there's nothing special right. about being a rocket league player but it feels it does feel kind of cool where it's like yeah this is the this is the superior game that the masses haven't discovered. <laughs> like that kind of right, attitude. right. That's cool. That's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, like it's wild when I first started getting into this game, and then you have that. You, the day you realize there's pro players in this. Like I'm not a huge gamer. Like this is the one game I was when I was a kid. I was a gamer. Now I'm like a gamer, Rocket League exclusively. There's yeah. pros and there's arenas, right? Kids and adults will fill up arenas and watch people play. There's yeah. celebrities in this space. You're one of them. But it's when it comes to becoming a pro. Like, what does it take to become a pro? What skills and sort of mindset do you have to even get close to that level? Hmm. To become a pro in this game, the path to become a pro. I mean, I think it, it's as rare as, uh, you know, have you seen those statistics in, okay, in, in, in high school, they would show us these stats for, for the athletes. And they would say, okay, high school athletes, of the athletes that are going to go on and play in college, it's like whatever, 20% of high school mm. athletes play in college. And then it's like of that percentage that go to pre play professionally, it's like 0.01% or whatever. They were trying to instill in us that like, you're not going to be a professional athlete. Like it's so rare. And in gaming, it's like the same way. Like the ones that reach the top, it's just, um, there's always that discussion of like natural talent versus just how much they played. Uh, and they definitely have the, the, the hours logged when you're at the top level. So they play the game. If you want to be a professional Rocket League player, you pretty much, you play all day. Like you don't really do anything else. And that's what it takes to go pro in gaming right now, because it's so popular now. It's not like you can just have some natural talent. Like you got to grind. It's all about the grind. So right. and Rocket League is, is no different. And it's, it's diminishing returns too. So I, I mentioned I have 5,000 hours. I got to a point where it was like, I was pretty good, but to get to the next level now, I would probably have to play, well, I have to play at least four hours a day to improve. Like right now I play an hour or two a day and I'm not really, I'm improving, but I'm not improving faster than the base. So my rank isn't going up. So it would just take a ton more time. Now, if I was like, I guess had more natural talent, maybe I would learn a little faster or I had coaching or something, but a lot of it is just those hours. So totally. Do you know the commitment? You, yeah, you know a lot of these pros, and we'll get into your work, you know, with pros and and working with them. But like, mm -hmm. do you know any crazy regiments? Like this guy, he plays this many hours, and he does. He goes to the gym six times a week to make sure that his like hands are like strong or whatever. Do you know a regiment <laughs> personally that it would be interesting to unpack? The only regiments I've heard where they're like where an, a, an esports organization will like really control the schedule or like have have something in place like that is the bigger esports. So like I know I know like League of Legends they'll have these um, they'll have you know big gaming centers where they'll have all their players they'll have practice rooms they'll have workout rooms all that stuff. Rocket League isn't quite that level where like that's a normal thing in orgs. The players kind of had to have to set that themselves. Uh, it's still like a new enough scene. So I've heard of a couple things like that like. I've always respected the pros that have a disciplined schedule like that, but some of them are not disciplined. Like it's just, they just play all day and that's good enough to keep them going, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting, I think that would be an interesting development to like optimize it, but I don't think it's been fully explored yet, to be honest. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I'm always curious. Like when I learned about even like chess, like they had to, if you're not in physical shape, like you can't yeah. play chess because of like how mental it is and how like, 
of a sport basically is. And I was curious, Rocket League, like those, the cramps in the hands and what do you do to like, make sure that your reflexes stay sharp. It's very interesting. Yeah. Like that world, how that will is developing probably has developed when, yeah, as more money gets into it, then like, yeah. it's one of those things where analytics will probably take over where it's like, look, if you're sleeping eight hours a night, you're going to be playing better. So we need you to do that. <laughs> like you're going to have to have a curfew and you're gonna have to get to sleep because we're paying you all this money. We want to get results. Yeah. You know? So exactly. I could see that happening for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, when it comes to money in the game, like the top pros, the highest earners for winning tournaments and maybe sponsorships, is there like a ballpark figure that that you know of? Like the top guy makes X amount of dollars a year. Yeah, well, the um, winnings are publicly available. So the tournament winnings are available for people to see. And so, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a lot, uh, but then that's not even their salary or anything. So the way it's set up now uh, the players have a lot of control in, at least in Rocket League. So they're getting their winnings, plus they're getting a salary from the org, plus their own YouTube and Twitch earnings. So it's actually like three sources of income for a pro. So, I mean, who knows? The top pros, uh, yeah, they're they're doing really well. They're getting a good salary. Like uh, in North America, if you're a top team, like those top eight teams, those are all most likely all six-figure salaries. And then wow. the pros that are leveraging their, their uh, fan base or their exposure by being on the RLCS broadcast and are content creators, then they get their own, mm. you know, the org doesn't take any of that. So making a YouTube channel, uh, the ones that are YouTubers, yeah, they're doing very well because they got that on top of their salary, on top of their winnings if they're, you know, winning majors. So, so it's yeah, fair there's to a lot say of there opportunity. Was, there'd be like some multimillionaire guys at the top. Oh, like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's sick. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's like a. I would say it's like the equivalent right now to like a, a minor, a minor like a minor league that's professional, but like right. Like I'm trying to think of the salaries of like I don't know MLS is a good example where it's like a it's you know soccer isn't the top sport in the U.S. yet, but it's you know like number yeah. five or something. And I was looking at some of their salaries, and it seemed like about the top of like RLCS. So that's about if that's about where it is, which is actually kind of crazy if you think about it. Yeah. No, it's mind blowing. Yeah. That if I keep, if I keep grinding on the switch, like I could be a millionaire in like 30 years. Yeah, you could. <laughs> Thank you. I'll dangle the carrot. Uh, yeah. What, well, let's talking about your, your own journey. Like, obviously we tell me that there's levels to this. Like you played a level that to me is mind blowing. And like, I probably could never get to your level without that intense grind. And probably you have some natural gaming skills, but do you ever, did you ever have an ambition to be like, I think I want to go pro or even now think that it would ever be something you would go for, or is that not even in, in your purview? Absolutely not, because I have seen what it takes, and it's. I, I really need to instill the fact that it's like nearly impossible for most people to go pro in games. Like, a lot of it's just the time. Like, you have to be able to, the attention span. Like, I would never want to put that much time into the game because I get mm. tired of playing after an hour or two. Like, I, you mm. just, you have to be so. You have to really enjoy the game, obviously, <laughs> but you have to be so singularly focused. Um, I don't know. It's it's a unique, it's a unique skill set to even get close to that. But no, never never entered my mind because I'm just not even close to that. I think back in the day when I was first, before I even had the YouTube channel, I was like seeing how I was improving. I was like, man, if I could just get to a thousand hours, I'll probably be around grand champion, and then maybe I'll be as good as pros. Hmm. But that was when I was at like 500 hours, and then 500 hours later, I realized I was nowhere near that, and I was like, oh no, this is uh, yeah, I realized. Yeah kind of how far I was. And so, yeah, no, impossible for me to be a pro in Rocket League. Right. Um, and on the age factor, right? Like when it comes to Rocket League and age and, and gaming, is there a certain like age cutoff where if you haven't basically started at this age or you've reached this age and you've started, like literally there's no, like in the NBA, right? Like you can't start after like, I don't know, 16, 17 years old. There's no way you're making the NBA. Yeah, that's an interesting point because there's obviously physical constraints to a physical sports. So you would think in gaming, if it's just your mind and I guess your fingers, then, you know, it could be anybody, right? Why is it, why is it dominated by young teens? Hmm. Uh, because that is currently, it's like 15 year olds is like the prime. Like the, these younger players are typically the best, like the best, the top five players in the world right now, I'm pretty sure like three of them are 15 and then two are like Crazy. 17, 18. So it tilts younger, but I think it's more about the schedule and like the ability to keep playing all day. 
I think that's more that. So like, it's just harder for an adult to play all day um, for various reasons. Responsibilities and maybe. Yeah, like, <laughs> right. Res- <laughs> things like responsibilities. Um, so it's hard to say yeah, yeah, if yeah. that's like, that's actually an interesting question in the community. It's like, is it because, uh, is it like the chicken or the egg? Like, wh- are there fewer older players because of the schedule or because like it literally is more difficult? I think there's also some like neuroplasticity things where like right. it's probably, there's probably some like actual advantages to being younger in gaming. Totally. Like when I, I had this conversation with my buddy, we joke, like, let's, let's keep grinding and turn pro. Obviously we're just joking, but I yeah, think yeah. it's just like, dude, like you're way too old. Like the reflexes, just like, even you see, like, you know, you're going up for the aerial and they get there like a split second in your mind, you were going at the same pace. We're talking yep. really seconds of yep. reaction time. Right. And that, de- you know, decreases with age. Right. Yeah, definitely. Crazy. Right. Yeah. So that probably, yeah, that's probably a big part of it too. That's interesting. You know, two of my favorite videos of yours, because I was going through a bunch of your content before this is like the youngest, I think it was grand champ, but I think he's nine years old. Oh yeah. I think it was that. And then vapor, the 70 year old guy, yeah. 7,000 hours, which is more than you. Now that I realize that that's crazy yeah. considering how much content you have and how much you've been playing this game. How did you, I don't know if you explained in that video, but like, how did he come, how did you come across him? And like, you know, were you shocked when you heard about him? Yeah. Uh, I, so one of his friends messaged me. I don't know how I saw it because I do have some messages off. I think it was email. I think I have email pretty open because not a lot of gamers use email. So that's kind of out there. Like anyone could email me. So mm-hmm. I think he just emailed me and said, hey, I have this um, I have this friend that's 70 years old. So I was kind of interested. But interestingly enough, it didn't surprise me that much. I, I, have, I get some messages like that pretty regularly where it's like, hey, especially when I start doing that content, like everyone's like, Oh, I have this friend. Um, so it doesn't always lead to anything. I've had messages like that that haven't led to anything. So it wasn't really actually until I was talking to him that I realized how cool he was. Um, but yeah, I guess I did agree to the video before we even, before I met him. Cause I was like, okay, yeah, let's, let's see how this goes. Um, but yeah, he just turned out to be such an interesting guy. I, there's no way I couldn't have totally. done, um, the video. Yeah. Um, yeah, what stuck out to me about him, it wasn't necessarily mm. just the fact that he was 70 years old. I just thought like his his attitude and like his story was really interesting. Um, so yeah, like th- what drew me in was the fact that he was 70, but what really made me interested in that was just who he was. He was just yeah. a really cool guy. That was a super cool video. And just like you said, just a great like being in the journalism space. Like some people, when you put a camera on or they know they're live yes. recording, they can either talk and articulate yes. or they can't. And when you get that, per- I'm sure I, I, we don't need to get into, it. I'm sure there's been people you've thought would make be amazing. And then they're awkward. Like I would get nervous yeah. if you're like, let's record a video with you. I would get nervous. Right. But he yeah. just, he was cool. He was a cool dude. Yeah. And you never know what you're going to get. So that's yeah. why I kind of approach it with like, okay, I'll just record this and we'll see what happens. And then yeah. he was awesome. And then really like I can work with pretty much anything. So it's just a matter of how much I'm going to have to edit <laughs> really. Mm, yeah, what it is. Yeah, yeah. And vapor, I didn't have to edit. Like it was just like, I had to cut down like all these amazing things, uh, you know, like editing wise. Right. So I didn't have to do, yeah. It just made it really easy for me when there's someone like that, that just shines. That was a really dope video. Let's get, now that's a perfect segue into sort of your journey into this space and becoming Mm -hmm. the content creator that you are and just super impressive what you've been able to accomplish and living like so many people's dreams, right? To create your own thing. It's awesome. But again, like the first time you played Rocket League, when was then the, the light bulb? Like, wait a second, like I have this, confidence the skills the desire to put myself out there and start a channel on youtube well what's interesting is i didn't develop a lot of those like i didn't develop a lot of those skills until i was a couple years in like it was a learning experience it wasn't like i had all the tools really at the start um which makes it even cooler because i can look back at my my earlier content and see how i've grown so at the beginning, my main desire was just as a creator, as someone that always made videos, um, that was always my career path in my mind. I was going to be like a video producer. Um, it was kind of the dream to just have people enjoy the videos you make. Like that's kind of just a yeah. overarching like dream of a creator. Um, I didn't have aspirations to really be a YouTuber, but where it clicked was just my interest in Rocket League. As it grew, I became um i don't know just like i got to a level where i was more comfortable with the game and like i understood the culture and like i i just i started to get a sense for what rocket league the rocket league community like liked in videos and what they wanted 
And so just putting that together, or it's like I had this, I had skills as a video producer. So um, I was like, I'll make Rocket League videos. And I, I had bad ideas because you know, there's this whole other skill set of like being a YouTuber that I hadn't delved into. But I had the two like pretty critical pieces of like knowing the source material and right. liking to make videos. So that's just what I did. And I made videos. Some of them were did well on YouTube and some didn't. And then I just started to learn what did better on YouTube over the years. And it took me like several years to really, um, I don't know, take it to the point where I could, where it became a career, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, I think if I'm not mistaken, I mean, it only took you like two to three years to hit like a million subscribers, unless there were other channels that aren't the main channel. But is that correct? Like it took about two to three years. I want to say that, yeah. I was, I plateaued for a long time where I was just making okay content. And I was, I had like, I feel like it was like a, a period of a year where I was between 18 and 100,000, you know, it was just mm. a long time. So I didn't have like crazy... I had moments where I would jump up in subscribers, but I didn't have crazy growth. It was pretty much slow mm. and steady, which That's is, cool. you know, it was kind of nice. It, I wasn't thrust into the limelight or anything, or I didn't have all this pressure. I was kind of just, my community was slowly growing as I got better at making videos. Mm. So that yeah, was kind of a good way to do it. When you hit it, when you hit a million, right? Like that's like a number you talk about people becoming pro and there's like the 0.0001% chance starting a YouTube channel, even if you're good or you're really ambitious and you put in the hours to get a million subscribers is no joke. What was that moment like when you kind of cross into a million? Do you, like, what does that feel like to hit a million? It felt really cool, but it was interesting because I had framed the way I'd framed my reaching a million subscribers was I had framed it as a race with a friend. Um, was that must sort of, yeah, it was musty. Yeah, so yeah, it was I like a that, sort of, yeah. <laughs> we did kind of a, uh, it was almost like a manufactured rivalry, but it was real as well because we were friends and we were kind of competitors. But I just really like the way YouTube works when it comes to other channels in your space because it's not really about competition. It's more like, I don't even know. Like you kind of, you actually want people to succeed because if more people are watching Rocket League videos, then it's a win for me. Like I, I right. get recommended based on Musty's videos. So it's like, it's not truly competition. So it makes so much sense to like, um, I don't know, have these sort of public races to a, a, a number, get in, get the fans involved, you know, where they were wanting one of us to win. But anyway, so I had, I had framed the, the race to a million kind of thing. And so Musty was already there. And so in a way, it actually felt less exciting. Like, I didn't feel like I was, I was, I don't know, like, I was like the man in Rocket League or anything. I was like the third person to reach it. But personally, yeah, it was really nice. It was really nice feeling. Um, I think it didn't really sink in until I got the plaque. Because when I got the plaque in the mail, it's like, right, this is the physical manifest manifestation of like a million subs. That's amazing. Um, That's which it's the one behind. Is it the the gold one or the yeah it's the gold one no, so sorry. i'd already had the the 100k one and that was a huge deal to me at the time as well i think that was in a way the hundred thousand was a was a i think bigger deal emotionally because mm. that was the first you know that was like oh my god youtube sent me a plaque like that's that, insane that's awesome yeah it's it's a good feeling i i don't really reflect on it that much anymore so that's kind of cool to think back on yeah no i'm i'm I just envisioning what i would feel like to to reach those kind of goals. And I think it's, it's pretty special to have those, those memories. And it's just, you, you reminded me of a question I had here too, about the community, right? Cause I know you, you do videos, you, you cross share your platforms you do with Musty and Floomp and Rizzo yeah. and stuff. Like you basically done with like all the main players and it seems like a close knit community and everyone's supporting each other. Is that, is that fair to say that behind the scenes too, like, you know, it's like a lot of camaraderie. Yeah. I, I was drawn in right away to the Rocket League community and I immediately like even when I was kind of newer to the scene, I was sort of an outsider still. I was, I was a fan of a lot of these people that I'm now friends with, which is, that's actually one of the things that I look back the most fondly on is like, I remember when I was just fans of these people and now I get to be friends with them. It's pretty cool. So I was already kind of, I was parasocially getting to know people before I really became noticeable enough to like reach out to those people and start working with them. And then naturally over time you become friends. Uh, but yeah, the, I, I immediately had positive experiences when I started uploading, not just with other creators, but also commentators. Like I never, I always had this impression in my mind that YouTube comments were just brutal and like really mean. And I don't know, it was just kind of like the unhinged internet. Mm. 
But the reality is, at least for Rocket League, um, just really nice commenters, like really nice um, viewers and followers. And every time I've every time I've worked with like a viewer, because I I like to include viewers in my videos a lot. It just always mm. it almost always is an amazing experience. Like I've had like I could count on my one hand the negative experiences, and I made hundreds of videos. So um, that's really one of the things that like keeps me going. I can't imagine being in a in a more toxic community where I'm like having to think about what I'm posting is like, people are going to make fun of this. Like I can really just be myself and be goofy right. and I know they're going to appreciate it or they're not going to like judge me. It's, it's so interesting you brought that up because I was going to ask you about how you base or how you understand the toxic level in Rocket League. It's, it's so refreshing to hear you say that, but you did have that tweet this week kind of about every time someone compliments me, a hundred percent guarantee <laughs> someone's going to diss me. But in, in that sense, it's like there's a line between people are kind of trolling and just being silly yeah. versus like violent and like, I'm going to kill you kind of stuff. So is there yeah. a bit of that? Like, how do you separate But someone's being toxic or someone's just taking a jab, but they actually like love me behind the scenes and they're just trying to have fun online? How do you how can you tell the difference? That's a really good question, because sometimes you can't tell the difference. Um, but I think it's just like certain... <sighs> For for like people taking jabs at me, it's oh, it's always like gameplay related. So and I, what I've had to learn, I'm, I'm a competitive person and I want to be good at the game naturally. But I still logically I know my place as like I just want to be an entertainer. It doesn't really matter what rank I am, um, but I always want to be entertaining and I want to be I want to be good at the game like naturally. So when I'm faced with the fact that I'm not like some commentators love pointing that out, um, you know I'm like what the heck? Like, let me have something. <laughs> it's just a weird, it's a weird dynamic where it's like, I'm good. I'm good for compared to most players, but I'm not really good compared to other creators maybe that are, you know, at the pro level or whatever, or what my viewers watch, like other creators that my viewers watch are better. Like Lethemir, for right. instance, professional right. player or was professional player. So there's like a weird comparison thing going on, but the key really is just to not care. Like I have to just, um, it's important as a as a creator to put more weight in the positive than the negative. So, and also, like you said, a lot of that is just really just friendly. So it's not about really. It's just about like not taking it personally and getting. You still need a thick skin, no matter how positive your community is, because there's always someone that's gonna like. Maybe they're yeah. right, you know. Point out your flaws. Right, so you right. have to be able to just like take it <laughs> or not read it. I've only had one like overtly bad experience where someone was in a chat saying like unspeakable things about my grandmother and so oh, I just had to like report that's only once but yeah, it's interesting yeah. right because sometimes you're like it's the the teammate that wants to forfeit as soon as you make one mistake or the like the weird stuff in the chat a I have to remind myself that sometimes these are kids and I'm yeah. not a kid and I, don't, I can't take it too seriously but I can get I find like I laugh at myself when I get riled up and then I start to yeah. think to myself like what is compelling these people people to behave in that toxic obnoxious way like because it is common for the teammate to get frustrated to get out of there for people to chirp each other do you see that as like this negative side of gaming that is a part of rocket league or is it all is it kind of is it fun do you see it as kind of funny i think it's just really human that's all i think it is i think rocket yeah. league is just like a game of life and so you're going to get teammates that um, are not empathetic and they only see their perspective. And so I think that's where a lot of the frustration between teammates comes. It's just people that aren't, um, that don't have the skills to, to empathize and be like, okay, you know, he's in a tough situation. So he made a mistake, you know, it, it's being able to like rationalize that. And I do it too. Like, like sometimes it's just really hard to see other perspectives. So I think it's like, um, that's why I think rocket league is a game of life. Cause it's, it's about practicing those skills where it's, uh, it's kind of like interpersonal and mentality, like becoming better at lifting up your teammates, even if they're making mistakes. Right. Or um, like you said, a big thing is not knowing if the other person is like literally nine years old. Like <laughs> you're, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's just like the internet, right? Like it's just like Twitter or something where it's like, is this person a troll? Should I really yeah, take them seriously? Right. right. Um, is this a child that I'm arguing with? Like you don't really exactly. know. So, yeah, it's just like learning how to navigate the internet yeah. in this age is totally. the same as Rocket League. <laughs>
but do you find yourself being like, I'm triggered and I'm angry and my blood pressure's up. What, oh, am, yeah. what am I doing here? What am I doing? <laughs> oh yeah. All the time. Yeah. All um, the time. It's, it's tough to, yeah, just not just to avoid that mindset, but yeah. <laughs> it's tough when you're in the mind and when you're a competitive person like me, it's tough to swallow a loss, but it's important yeah. to learn. Bef yeah. Before we move on and talk about rule one, I want to get into that next with you. Just mm -hmm on the YouTube channel, knowing how hard it is to produce content, what is the grind like to be sort of at your level? Um, yeah, I mean, it's the, the real like grind and pressure is to produce regularly. And like by regularly, I mean like every week or two. So over the years that, yeah, that, that takes its toll. It, it's, it's not always about it's not always about just how rushed everything is. A lot of times it's just, uh, it's the motivation because you've, I've, I've made like hundreds of Rocket League videos now. And so to keep going, um, it's really important to, I don't know, keep things fresh and, and have variety in my life. So I'm not, you know, just in this tunnel of Rocket League all the time. Um, Cause I come up with better ideas when I'm sometimes removed from it and like doing something else and exploring other hobbies. So I, a big part is just like maintaining a healthy work life relationship with with YouTube. Um and it's hard to do because yeah. you you feel that pressure to regularly upload. Yeah. So yeah. I'd say that yeah, that's the biggest challenge. That's the biggest difficulty. Do you have any like coping mechanisms you've developed like whether I don't meditation or I got to go for a walk or like is I'm always curious cuz in my own life I try to think about that when I'm stressed and things become overwhelming like how the hell do I deal with that? You're talking about maintaining something that has a lot of momentum. So I'm always fascinated by that side of things. Yeah, it, it definitely feels better to maintain. Like now that I've had this experience of doing things, uh, it's not, it's, it's easier, but in other ways, yeah, new challenges present themselves just from doing it for so long. Uh, like I said, to keep motivated and yeah, there's definitely tips and tricks that I've learned. Um, yeah, going, like you mentioned, going for a walk, uh, getting outside the house. A lot of it is like those cliche, like life tips, like getting enough sleep and like having a regular schedule. Um, those all work really well for the YouTube career. Um, I feel like there's been more since, since COVID there's been more of that, like work from home, um, like culture that's developing. And so people are learning how terrible it can be if you don't, uh, establish like good habits. So it's interesting seeing more stuff and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. I, I had to learn that a couple of years ago. Um, Cause it also catches up with you slowly. Like if you don't take care of it, if you don't take care of your, um, I don't know, your mental health and things like that. Um, it does catch right. up with you. Right. Well, oh, absolutely. So yeah, a, a lot of those things I also learned from, from like therapy. So like, that was a big part is, it's like, I, I didn't really, I kind of thought I could just kind of handle it on my own. Like I, I was doing really well the first couple of years, but then, yeah, I, if you let it slip a little bit, and I got too involved, then yeah, it can be bad. You can, you know, just mostly normal things like anxiety and depression, but then talking to someone um, that knew kind of the YouTube culture or like at least was like younger and aware enough that they knew sort of, uh, I don't know, they knew, they, they understood what it was like to be a content creator just from exposure to that kind of thing. And so they were able to like, I didn't have to explain a lot, like, the people I spoke to like immediately knew, um, oh yeah, like you're probably in your room all the time. You're probably already making, you're making videos all the time. Like you knew my situation. And so, yeah, just hearing someone say like, yeah, you have to get out. You have to do some other things. You need to have friends outside of the scene. And um, yeah, just like stuff that I knew, but I hadn't really like, when you hear someone say it, you're like, oh yeah, okay. That, yeah, I definitely yeah. need to be doing that. So That's someone to keep you on track is really useful. Yeah, that's so cool you brought up therapy because I was thinking before this, I'm like, I wonder if he like does therapy. I was having this joke in my mind, but I miss this air dribble and like, and then I, it, I, I, my sense of being disappeared, but that's so cool. <laughs> into it. Like, because especially because, you know, you're in, influential to so many young people. And I think therapy is, is, has lost that taboo edge, which is such a great oh, thing yeah. now. And it just to hear you say that is, is pretty cool because, you know, everybody kind of needs it, but it's, it's cool that you brought that up. Cause I was going to ask you and I was worried you'd be like, no, that's, it's important. <laughs> be, what the heck? important. Yeah. yeah um, for sure. Yeah. Um, before I forget two things, then we'll get into rule one. Mm -hmm. So this AI bot video you made, 
you know, to me, that was quite interesting. I saw a lot of people commenting about it online, like this next two player, next toe player, um, in ranked really good, obviously is a bot. Is this just like this, is this a random development or is this like a big deal that these kind of bots could infiltrate ranked and competitive play? Like, is this actually a threat to the, to the legitimacy of the game? I think it is a threat to the game, um, but I think there's solutions out there. Other games have dealt with this kind of thing before. Um, it's just Rocket League has had the fortune to not have to deal with uh, any huge cheating scandals that I know of. So there are some questions like, why is this happening now? I think it's just honestly like technology breakthroughs and people becoming aware that they're able to do this. Um, I am surprised that there's so many. I'm seeing so many reports about it. Because I, in my mind, it was a pretty technical thing to be able to deploy a bot into ranked. Uh, it's definitely really difficult to make. So that part is why it's taken so long. Uh. Um, I do know that um, just from hearing from the makers of the bot. Like it's taken years to develop a AI um, controlled car that is good at the game. Like that took some real development. It didn't just happen. So you spoke to the, was that in the video? That you spoke no, to so I no. referenced a, th- a Reddit thread. That's where I'm getting all that information. Oh, okay, and okay. In that thread, they sort of describe what went into it a little bit, and it's it's really pretty interesting. Um, the way it learned through machine learning, where it's not like nothing is in its code on how to play Rocket League. It only uh-huh. knows just from experience and correction. So it also needed years of so it needed years of development. It needed people that really knew what they were doing and were able to correct it and knew the game and knew what it means to be good at the game. Mm. Um, so it's not like anyone can just do it, but now for some reason, someone figured out how to get into ranked and then sharing that information. And so now the threshold for getting into it, I'm guessing is just low enough where enough people right. are doing it where it's not difficult or they don't care about getting banned. Yeah. Cause I feel like pretty soon there's going to be like some pretty harsh bans and those people are going to realize that they're not able to play rocket league at right. all anymore. Hopefully like I I'm for that. Um, like an right. IP ban, those are a little tougher to circumvent. So I hope they just correct. I wish they would have done it quicker. Like I, I think ideally you would have just addressed it right away and said like, look, if there's any sort of violations like this, you're going to get an IP ban. You're not going to play, like you're not gonna be able to play ever again. So just think about it before you do it. I don't know if some of these kids probably aren't thinking that through. But they're like going to crack down on it now, as far as you know, like, and they're, they have yeah. to basically, or the integrity of the game is on, on the line. <laughs> yeah, I think they pretty much um, have to. Yeah. That was fascinating. I love just the tech when it starts to advance in these areas. Like it's mind blowing how it even works. Like obviously I have no clue how it works, but it's, yeah. I just saw that that was like the latest thing people were talking about and your video yeah. obviously started that conversation. Um, moving on to, to rule one, you've now like successful content creator, millions of subscribers. You could have stayed in, in that lane in that space and you're going to stay in that lane and in that space but you're, you're an ambitious guy and you've sort of created this, this esports organization called rule one. You're going to like have teams. You're going to do other cool rocket league content creation sort of stuff. Tell me about why you want to do this at this point in your career. Well, some of it is actually kind of selfish where it's like, I really just wanted to develop some of these skills outside of just being a YouTuber. Mm. So, um, I don't know, like learning to be a leader or run a company is quite a bit of different skill set than uh, being kind of a lone wolf YouTuber. And a lot of YouTubers will just build their, their uh, build a team on their own channel. But for me, a lot of my content has been like personal enough where I haven't really collaborated or outsourced that much in terms of hiring people. Um, so this is kind of, uh, an exercise in that and like building a team and like having, uh, having a group of people that are creating stuff that's, you know, in my head, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, but yeah, I, I like what you said about not like not exiting my lane too much. So that was an important part. I've, I've always had these ideas of, you know, where I could go next, even just diversifying what I'm doing. Like, I don't want to just be a YouTuber. Mm. Um, even, and in the future too, like, it's not just about right now, you know, it's like, I wanted to develop some skills and, and build something bigger than my channel. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I've, I've gone into the esports scene, but stayed in rocket league in a community that I already really know. Mm. Um, and so it seemed like a really logical thing and it wasn't that it was separate enough where I I'm very challenged and learning new skills, but not so much that I'm completely 
like out of my depth. It's an exciting move, man. It's super ambitious and it totally makes sense. Like thinking longevity and, and also just trying new things. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk a little bit about your partner in civic. Yeah. And from what I understand, like I, I was Googling stuff. There's like Reddit threads, like, who is this guy? What's his name? It's, it's, oh, he's a very mysterious person. Yeah. Is, 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 is his real name even out there? Like, do people don't know his real name, right? I don't think so. But it's really funny because in the gaming community, that's like accepted practice. So it's not even really questions. Okay, so, like no one knows right. anybody's real name. Right. So what can, obviously, okay, from, from Saudi Arabia has been a figure in supporting content creators, propping up, you know, people's ability to play, finding solutions for them to like develop as players in, in Saudi and potentially the rest of the Middle East. What can you tell me about him and like why he, why you've partnered with him and why he's, you know, this special figure in the community? Yeah. I think on a surface level, a lot of people know him just for his donations to Twitch streamers and sort of bankrolling various events in the Rocket League community. Um, so that's like a very surface level in the community. Most people are aware of that, hmm. but what made me want to work with him is more once I got to know him. So, and seeing the leadership and skill sets he had and vision, um, and becoming friends with him, uh, that's what made me want to work with him. So, uh, just seeing, yeah, we had the same idea, really. It was just like, we both wanted to build an org. We both, he had already, uh, led an org at one point. Um, and when that didn't work out, uh, he wanted to, he was, he was stepped away from that situation, but he wasn't turned off to rocket league esports at all. And really wanted to make something and maybe have a partner that could sort of, um, I don't know, just share the load a little bit and, and sort of collaborate. Like he wanted a more collaborative environment and stuff. Cause it was pretty much just him. Um, so yeah, just through discussions and, and, uh, finding out that we wanted similar things and that we had the same ideas and, and dreams is what brought us together. And as far as it goes, like he's mysterious. He wants to keep it that way. You're not at liberty to go into any details about him, right? That's just a thing that he wants to maintain that mystery as he moves forward. Right? Like that's, that's just sort of his MO. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely his thing. And yeah, I, I got to know him fairly well through, um, you know, before going to business with him and stuff. So I, I was confident in who he was and like, I knew enough about him where I wasn't, I don't feel like I'm going to business with this shadowy figure. Um, uh, but yeah, as far as his persona, he likes to be behind the scenes. We've talked about him attending lands in the future and he likes to have these ideas of like no one knowing who he is and stuff. So that's like part of the fun for him as well. So, uh, part of it is protecting privacy, but part of it is also just like, that's what he likes to do. He likes to be this behind the scenes guy. And that actually works out really well for us. Cause I can be the sort of face of it or whatever, and he can support doing behind the scenes stuff and also, you know, whatever he wants to do without being, I don't know, always explaining himself or something. So it's, it's actually a really fun partnership. That's cool. So he's like the, the Banksy of Rocket League. Yeah. <laughs> he's like the Banksy of Rocket League. Yeah. Kind uh, of. I, yeah. It's interesting. I think that's cool. Like I would love to know his net worth. I don't think you're going to say that on mic right now, but it's amazing to think that someone does cool, cool stuff with their money like that. Like yeah. I imagine myself being, assuming that he's obviously a millionaire, maybe he's a billionaire. I don't know, knowing Saudi, um, but it's just cool. Like it's a fun way to be spending your money. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like what I, I, all the time I'm like, you know, if I was in civic and I was in his position, this is exactly how I would spend my money. <laughs> like I would, yeah, yeah. he's a gamer. He's in the gaming scene. He, he's actually in a lot of Twitch chats, not even just rocket league. So he, he's pretty well connected in all of gaming because he really, he like that's how he likes to spend his money. Like he likes to support creators that he enjoys. So yeah. he'll go into Twitch chats. He'll drop a lot of subs and that gets him attention. So he's able to meet these creators that he loves. Cause so it's like, you know, there is kind of a thing on Twitch where it's, it's tough because you have so many people reaching out to you or, or YouTube, like as a creator. So it is hard. Like someone really has to stand out. And sometimes that's just a big fat donation. That's going to get your attention. Yeah. And so he's able to do that because he has the resources. He's like, I can, you know, but then he turns out to be this really cool guy. So he's able to make friends with whoever he wants to, because he's cool. really friendly. Like he's really just a great person. So it's not hard for him to make friends once he gets people's attention. That's kind of just how he goes about it. So you're, you're right. It is cool. Like it's probably what it I would cool. do too. If I was a gamer, yeah, yeah. if I was a rich gamer, that's what I'd do. Yeah. So this, you've signed this first team. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if anything's changed in the last few days when I was reading up on, on rule one KRN out of, out of Saudi three, three yeah. players. What can you tell me about the team and like, why, why these guys? 
Well, so in Civic knows that scene really well, that, that uh, region really well, because he was actually instrumental in getting that region recognition and access to RLCS. So um, before in Civic, several years ago, um, the only way to really get to the highest level of competition, which is RLCS, is you had to be uh, from North America, um, Oceania was a region, Europe, and recently South America, or the most recent edition was South America. So then they did another expansion, and now uh, MENA, Middle East and North Africa, right. is a region. South Africa is a region, um, Asia Pacific. So they added some of those minor regions. Um, but to add those minor regions, they had to know that these teams were going to be, that those regions were going to be able to produce like top tier talent. So in Civic was instrumental in showcasing the top talent from his region. So he had a pretty intimate knowledge of the talent. Um, from that region and also because minor regions are, are newer they're also more affordable so they're a little less established but they have the same level of talent so that's actually why we ended up going with krn because they're super talented and we know they can compete with the other regions um but they're also great for a young org that you know we want to be conservative and grow slowly so it's perfect where it was like okay we can have this amazing team um but we don't have to overextend ourselves so it was it was perfect that's awesome and i read that there's two identical twins on the team yeah Yazid and saleh and i wanted like talk about that like how does that affect the play is there something special about the fact that they're identical twins and the way they play together is it is there something going on there that's interesting yeah that was a big part of why i wanted to sign them too so there's also a content side to it um that i haven't fully explored yet um but yeah there's a big thing about, I, I want to explore what the twin effect really is. Um, they're definitely the highest level twins that have ever played in Rocket League. So, I mean, how does that even happen? These two guys must just be playing all the time in their house. Like it's, <laughs> it's kind of a cool thing. I can't wait to like delve into that and do a story on it. Um, but actually it's funny that you said that because a coach, a friend of mine, that's a coach, um, they've been doing scrimmages against our team. And mm. so he he was just like, I don't know if you've seen scrimmages, but it's really interesting watching the twins play because they do have this crazy twin energy, like where they're that's in sick. sync. And so it was kind of like affirmation. I was like, oh, that's cool to hear from you about that. Um, so yeah, there's definitely something there. And also just, I mean, on a surface level, it sounds really crazy. Like identical twins in Rocket League. That's uh, at the highest level. That's really awesome. So that's definitely some like a little story point that we're going to be using. Oh, totally. Yeah, that's exciting, man. And the age, just quickly, the ages, like they're quite young, right? Like these are yeah, in that like range 15. we talked about earlier. That's sick. Yep. I, a question I, before I forget, have you ever been to Saudi Arabia and do you plan to go if not? I haven't been to Saudi yet, but I'm definitely going to be going. Um, they do run some pretty big tournaments there for Rocket League. Uh, Gamers 8 is an organization that has run uh, like a huge tournament, actually. They've only done one so far, but I'm quite sure they're going to do some more. So... I'll probably be there at the next one, um, getting to hang out within Civic, and our team will will compete for sure in it. It'll be in their home turf, so that will be awesome. Honestly, I, I really can't wait for that. That'd uh, be but, exciting yeah. to, to know your your impressions of that in the future. I'd be curious oh, yeah, to know. yeah, exactly. Because obviously, it's very interesting countries, right? With like just a lot of money, right? Um, and yeah. like you said this guy in Civic. Uh, you can text me the net worth later and I won't, I won't, it public. I'm just, I'm just showing you, but it's just like, it's cool. Like to see them investing in these cool spaces. So just a fascinating, yeah. very unique place in the world. So that's, that's interesting to have the connection to, to Saudi like that. Um, a, th a question I had was thinking about like the barriers to families allowing their children to sign onto an org like yours or take gaming seriously. Like, I think we're still even in the early stage in North America, you know, you have like the, the ninjas or even just looking at your own story. Like I can say, look, this guy has a career off playing video games. They're, they're, they're good people, but it's still kind of a bit like you could see parents being like, no, you're not going to try to get into gaming in the middle East or even in the MENA region. Is there any thing you're learning where it's kind of like, there are these barriers that are hard to overcome right now that need to be broken down to allow kids to be able to flourish? It's really interesting because I see a lot of people in the gaming space take the position that, yeah, parents should let their kids play as much as possible because look where I got. But really, I think I have to be a little careful there where it's like, 
it's kind of like a movie star like telling kids hey follow your dreams but it's like that movie star was the person they just had met the right people and they you know there's lots to go into like being... obscenely obscenely good looking so it's like yeah obviously. right yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like well can everybody do that and so i have kind of a i have some reservations about just being like yeah you, anybody can do this um not that i have not that i've like am different or something but i do have a unique background that set me up to be a youtuber like it wasn't like i was obscenely good at the game so it wasn't like the hours in the game i had to be good enough there was a certain level where i had to reach where i was comfortable with the game and i played a fair amount um but yeah it was just my you know i had these i had these video production skills i you know was familiar with youtube like my the way my brain works just worked for youtube really well like the platform mm -hmm. worked for me so it was a lot of things that really came together um you know the job i worked at wasn't uh they we only did a four day work week. So I had Fridays off and I was able to make videos on that day. So there were so many things that worked out for me. Um, so it's hard for me to be like, yeah, just play as much as you want. But I think like to become a pro, you really do have to play all day. I feel like the parents that let their kids play all day are already at the point, like if they're already at the point where you're letting your kid play all day, you're, then you're supporting them. You know, once they're actually <laughs> yeah. like, in the leagues and stuff and there's another layer of level of support that they need that um right i, I like the, a lot of that stuff like where we hear about parents supporting yeah. uh, their kids once they reach that level but i mean a lot of it is just like assessing you know I, it's just like I, I can't endorse just like letting your kid play games all day i don't really think it's that right. healthy to be honest so it's super fascinating you bring that up because it's one of my one of my questions is like you're this is your world this is your community it works for you but there's so many parents and just general people like video games are bad. And if you're addicted and you're obsessive, it can really turn dark in some ways for a lot of kids. So how do you, how do you try to make sure, how do you understand what that balance should look like? How do you know if yeah. you should, you know, dedicate your, your time and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not a parent, so I also don't, can't really give parenting advice, but yeah, I think moderation is really the, the, the key to it. Like right. just being involved seems like the optimum way to go about it. Like knowing what your kid's playing, I think is great. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I think there's a lot of just like the bare minimum, like knowing what your kid's playing, knowing who they're playing with and having a loose idea of how much they're playing. Like I, when I grew up, it was pretty strict. Like I only got like half an hour, an hour a day. And I think I could have probably been fine if I would have played another hour. And sometimes I did, you know, but so I'm not going to say it needs to be super strict, but I think just like, yeah, a good healthy middle ground. I think I ha I've established because of that, those limits I had, I've established like limits in myself just naturally. Be I don't know if it's because of that, but you know, I play for a while and then I'm like, I need to do something else. So right. I don't know if that's instilled in me because I had limits on gaming or because I just got bored. Maybe I just have a bad attention span. So, you know, that, like, I don't really know. Like when you said one to two hours a day, I was, I was expecting to be like four or five, six a day. So that's you know, some days, to... <laughs> yeah, no, some I days it's up there. Some days it's up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, I, sure, I play a lot sure. of games for sure. That's like my main hobby for sure. Yeah. But yeah. You've done something very miraculous and that is you've got your wife on board with the vision, right? And Linnell, your wife has plays a major role like in your success. And I think she's an advisor with rule one. I yeah. know she's appeared in some videos with you. I don't know if behind the scenes she's helping out, like bounce ideas off. Maybe she's even editing. I don't know that side. But talk to me about Linnell and how important her support and behind the scenes, what role she plays with the Sunland, Sunless Con um, story. Well, she was, always, she was always really supportive and she always loved the idea. And I'm just trying to think how it evolved over the years. Um, you know, she had her own job and everything. And so for a while, it was just a hobby for me. Um, once it got to the point where I quit my job and went full-time YouTube, um, it didn't take any convincing because it was, I waited so long. It was to the point where it was like a really dumb decision not to quit my job. Uh, so that wasn't controversial at all in our household. Um, so always had full support, but um, she's become more involved once I got to a point where I was really getting bogged down with a lot of things that I didn't want to do with my channel, but that needed to get done. Um, like a lot of logistical stuff or planning, um, reaching out to people, a lot of behind the scenes things. So that's where she started to get more involved was once I got, it got to be too much for me and she kind of just stepped into that role. I could have probably hired someone, but she had a lot of those skills. And so she just kind of stepped up 
and yeah, it's been really great. Only downside is that we're constantly talking about work. So right. again, it's like that. It's like learning that balance, which we're getting there as well. Um, and she has her own pursuits and stuff. It's kind of, I think the other downside is just like, she never really can feel like it's like a real job because it's just me and her. Like it's, it's always like, mm. I mean, YouTubers are already struggling with that where it's like, do I even have a real job? Like, and what am I doing here? <laughs> it can be unsatisfying if you don't feel like you're, you know, have meaning in your work. So making sure we're both like have meaning in what we're doing is important. Um, but mostly it's been amazing because she does have a lot of those skill sets like managing and, and organizing. So it's been great. It's been exactly what I've needed. That that's inspiring, man. You live in you live in the dream in in many ways. Um, what's is she, what is she? What's her rank these days? Does she still play at all? Is she like a oh no, she, she hates the not, game. So. She hates the game. Yeah. <laughs> it's really refreshing. Uh, so at least we have that. I think if she was a Rocket League player, maybe that would become too much at that point. So you know, I want someone that's a little bit outside. So she does have some removal from like gaming culture, which is actually really cool. yeah, great, I think. Yeah, yeah. But now she's become. Uh, as she's interacted more with people, she's in the scene. She's becoming well known, and she has friends in the scene now. So she's also comfortable, which is good. Um, but it's not so comfortable that she's like playing every day or something. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I have a few more rapid fire questions. I feel like I've gone over yeah. my time a little bit, but if you have like five no minutes, are you yeah. cool with that? Yeah, um, let's do it. Just on a, on a basic sense, like where would you like to see Rule One five, ten years from now? five to 10 years for rule one. I would love to see it, um, with like 20 or more employees, um, producing content. Uh, really, I would like, uh, I'd be really happy if in five to 10 years we had maintained or improved upon our, our culture and ideas for how we run to run the company. Like if I could maintain that, that's one of my main goals. So, um, you know, still being involved in some capacity, um, yeah, putting out the content that we wanted to do. I mean, the main thing is like, as long as we're still existing in five years, that would be amazing because esports is super right. volatile. So if we're existing in five years, we have a number of employees where, you know, we're providing a living for a lot of people in gaming and we're making the content that we still want to make and we have the same attitude and, and like company culture, then that would be incredible. That's my goal. Good luck for sure. Do you <laughs> think? Do you think Rocket League should be an Olympic sport? Ooh. If gaming is an Olympic sport, then I think Rocket League, it would be important that Rocket League is included in that. So if they get past the gaming like part of it, mm. then I think if games are going to be an Olympic sport, then Rocket League is, I think, the like, top, I would say the top candidate or at least in the top five of like skill-based games that aren't relied on, um, you know, random events or anything. Uh, I if think Rocket League has got to be up there, yeah. If you were a betting man, could you foresee that ever happening? Or is that a, would you bet yay or nay on that ever happening? That's a really good question. Because I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about it. Like it's, it's evolving. That Culture is evolving yeah. so much, right? Yeah, it feels like it feels inevitable. But at the same time, I think it would just take forever for the for them to really recognize like in the olympics like we're talking about like a <laughs> yeah, yeah. heavy traditionally seeped like yeah, sporting yeah. event like the most the most traditional sporting event and they're adding sports all the time though so i don't i don't know I, I could see both ways I, probably yeah. i'll just say probably okay. Okay. surely in 100 years like yeah do you think rocket league is a game like the gameplay needs to evolve or is it best that it just stays where it is because the simplicity and where it works is fine I think the gameplay cannot evolve. I think it's really important that it has it stays the same. I think everything around the game, like extra features, um, creative modes, creative ways for players to create their own levels and stuff like that, should all evolve and be built on. But the actual core gameplay, I think it has to stay the same because that's it's they've hit the magic formula. So adjusting anything in that is kind of probably not a bad not a good idea. I agree with you on that one hundred percent. Top for you, what are the most like one, two, three, whatever comes to mind, most like iconic moments in the sports history? What do you rate as like, you know? Oh yeah, easily. Yeah. Um, the greatest goal in Rocket League history is that this is Rocket League moment for sure. Um, huge moment in the world championship Justin. where Justin hit this, this shot with zero seconds and 
there was this iconic this is rocket league call from a commentator so that's the top moment in rocket league history uh squishy hitting a ceiling shot which that was a, a new mechanical move mm. that uh pros were experimenting with but to see it, it, it you know he pulled it off at the biggest stage in the world championships um that would be another moment um and then for third it's tough because it then you get into like three or four really amazing moments as well that you would have to debate but like one thing about the rocket league esports is it does always produce really exciting moments so it's it's re a really good product so i think that's why it also has you know kind of staying power is people who watch rocket league tend to really enjoy it and it's it's because it delivers those moments who is your favorite I was going to say content creator, but I don't want to put you in that position, although maybe you've already said that and you're fine with that, but who's your favorite player? Like, who do you love to watch and think is the most exciting player in the game right now? Well, obviously <laughs> I'm a little biased, but I'd say right. Rawas, yeah. Rawas, the player on my okay. team, yeah, yeah, hey. because he is insane right now, um, winning all these 1v1 tournaments and um, because there are minor tournaments that happen throughout the year, um, especially mm -hmm. in 1v1, which is not the main competitive playlist. Um, so I'm really excited by his his um, emergence as a 1v1 superstar, like one of the best players in the world right now. So uh, I would say Rawas for me. Excellent. The Seth Rogen comparisons, how sick of it are you genuinely? Uh, genuinely, I don't think I'm sick of it genuinely because I can never, I, I'm not gonna be upset for someone making an observation. <laughs> Yeah. But it is kind of funny how much I get it. It's it's a lot. It's a lot. Was it the community that pointed that out or before you were a public figure? Did you look you look like Seth Rogen a little bit or whatever. It was only the community. I never got it in person because in person I don't actually look like him at all. Uh it was like a time in my life where I was wearing glasses and had a beard and Seth Rogen was sporting the exact look. It was like 2017. And so and I I kind of have my laugh count sounds kind of like him. So they kind of just put it together. I can see I it. Like, I can see it. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah. I, I could see it too like, when people said it. Like I was like, okay, this is funny. But it led to me actually getting to play with Seth Rogen at one point. I so saw. I was going to ask what that full, full circle moment. That was that was really cool. Yeah, top memory of my channel for sure. Yeah. Um, couple quick last ones. Yeah. Pet peeve of mine: forfeiting. You know, you're you're down two Ooh. nothing with two and a half minutes left. I make some silly mistake where I miss a shot mm. I should have made. The guy wants to forfeit and then maybe yeah. exits. What is your philosophy on when it's time to forfeit and should you ever forfeit? <laughs> I think you should forfeit with like, with like, if you're down four with like 30 seconds left, I guess. But then again, it's like, you never know. Um, I've seen some crazy comebacks. So I think if you leaving early, you just shut yourself off to some amazing moments. So is there ever really a reason to exit a five minute game earlier than five minutes? It's five minutes. Do you, ever, do you ever smash that forfeit button when you're playing? You know, as I'm yeah. saying that, I'm thinking the times where I did forfeit. So do as I say, not as I do, because I've definitely forfeited earlier than that. But. Do, do, you have, do you have a pet peeve? Like that's my pet peeve and I, it makes oh. me angry every time. Is there one that stands out? Like every time somebody does this, I, my blood boils. Definitely commentating on your teammates play in any capacity, I think is really annoying and, and unnecessary because like mm. they're not going to adjust within the five minute time frame, especially if you're playing with a random stranger. Like wh why would you need to like, why would you need to commentate on someone else? Like, so it's like whether it's forfeiting early when they make a mistake, quick chatting, uh, typing after something like I thought you were going to go for that or like blaming after a goal. It's just like, why would you? What do you think that's going to lead to? Like, it's not going to make the vibes good. Vibes yeah. are very important in Rocket League. Vibes yeah. are very important. When everyone's oh. feeling good, that's when you win. So anything no, you do, yeah, I, you probably know. Yeah, you definitely know this. Anything you do to bring down the vibes as a teammate, you've uh, failed your team. So it's just incredible. It's like we're in ranked <laughs> and we're trying to win here. Like, let's be nice to each yeah, other. Yeah, I'm on your side. <laughs> I want to win too. You think I'm trying it, to suck? A favorite Rocket League meme? that maybe jumps out that it lives rent free in your head. I like the, uh, I like the roster changes one. Um, it's not even really, it's not really that strong of a meme to be honest, but it's <laughs> every time there's a roster change, there's this picture of like Gibbs. And I think it's actually the moment when Justin scores the, the, the goal in the, the best, okay. the best moment in Rocket League history is someone captured the moment where he's like, um, he was away from the desk, but he was like, Oh, oh. And so there's right, like a photo. Yeah. 
it's like a close up of his face and it's like faded into like a wider picture of him like mind blown type thing. So now that goes with roster changes for some reason. So whenever there's a roster change, someone's like roster changes and it shows Gibbs like <laughs> that's awesome. So that that's probably my favorite meme. Mine's the the guy that sits up in the chair when the what a save comes on because what? like you're, he's sitting back in the chair and then he says what a oh save, yeah and then he, he sits like, up <laughs> so that's my favorite because i was like that's me every fucking time that's a really um, good one yeah yep, the quick chatting will bring out the yeah i'll make you yeah. sit up just to just to wrap it up so grateful yeah. for your time and such an honor to and pleasure to meet you and chat with you but yeah just for people people who might you know watching or reading this and you know want to be a content creator want to or maybe go pro but maybe stick to the content creator thing what's your sort of advice for them i'm sure you get this question a lot but what do you what do you think you would like to impart on them i think um i think focusing on what you can control in your career is really important so i think honing your own skills is that's the approach i took um rather than relying on trying to get collaborators and trying to try to get key friendships or or I don't know, kind of working your way in that way, um, or through clout or being well known, I think is not as productive as just developing your own skills and making yourself stand out because you're just better at something than most people. I think that's my favorite way of that's how I, I came up in the scene. So that's how I would advise everyone else to do it too. <laughs> it worked out for me. So I would That's say, awesome. I think yeah. it's just great to hone your skills because you can't really lose. Like if you don't end up reach, achieving your goals, now you're just worst case scenario, you're slightly better at something you have developed. So hone your skills is my advice. That's awesome. Well, thanks, Jared. It's uh, thank you for this interview, man. And thank you for all your time. It's awesome to meet you. And yeah. congrats, man, and all the success. Thanks.